I'm Anita Jones. I'm a geriatrician in Sunderland. I'm also one of the IMT training programme directors for Health Education England, North East and North Cumbria. And I co-chair the IMT Advisory Committee. Um, the last two roles I share with Jane Wallace, who's our first speaker today. Um, Jane's going to give us an overview of IMT. Then we've got an expert on recruitment, Stephen Harding. And then three trainees, Hannah, Paula and Lydia, who are going to talk about IMT recruitment and IMT in general from a trainee perspective. We've also got time for questions and we're recording this, as you've heard, and it will appear on the JRCPTB website for future reference too. Um, so without further delay, I'd like to hand over to Jane, who's going to give us an overview of IMT. Thanks, Anita. So, yes, hello, I'm Jane Wallace. As Anita says, I'm Training Programme Director and Co-Chair for IMT. <coughs> and um, welcome to all of you. So we're really pleased you are thinking about applying for IMT. Um, this is going to be very brief for me because the experts are Stephen and the trainees. Um, but first of all, this is relevant if you're applying for IMT this time round. Obviously, the recruitment window has just opened, but we're going to give you some tips on maximising your score and also how to uh, perform best in the interview. It's also relevant if you're applying in future years and there's lots of tips on how to prepare your application over the next year, two years, however long you've got. Um, so the first thing to say is IMT is now competitive. So you need to do everything you can to maximise your score pre-interview because that is how you secure an interview. And then you get to show us all how great you are in interview. Um, so it's really important that you score appropriately. Um, there's information on the website about not overscoring and comments about persistent and blatant overscoring, which can potentially get you removed from the application process and even potentially refer to the GMC. This is not a reason to underscore yourselves. Um, so if you're, you know, some of your scores won't fall exactly between two, you know, won't fall exactly into one box. If you're not sure, ask for advice from a supervisor, a TPD. And if you're really not sure, you don't have to go for the lower one. That's not what we're looking for when we're talking about persistent and blatant overscoring. It may be perfectly reasonable to score the higher mark. And it is really important to remember if you underscore yourself, you may not end up with an interview. Um, so really important. And there'll be more about that. Um, I'm going to very briefly mention some of the benefits of the internal medical tra medical training, particularly compared to the old core medical training. So first of all, there's been lots of worry about the, the dreaded med reg role, and that is a much more supported transition in the new programme, and Hannah's going to talk about that a bit more. There's also a more robust supervisory process um, and more clinical wise, a sort of protected time for intensive care, uh, outpatient clinic training, SIM, you all do elderly care. Um, so some real benefits for the programme, we think. And the final thing I'm going to mention briefly is some of the increased flexibility of the programme. So less than full time is now much, but there's much better support for that and a much easier process for trainees who want to work less than full time. There's also a process for recognition of uh, capabilities you may have acquired in between foundation and IMT. And there's a process where you can accelerate your training if that's relevant. There's also opportunities to take time out of programme, and Paula's going to talk about that a little bit more. So that was brief, but that's quite enough from me. <laughs> I'm going to hand over, um, and I hope you find this evening really valuable. Hello. Thanks. Thank I'm you, Jay. <laughs> Stephen, over to you. Hi, uh, my name's Stephen. I manage the Physician Specialty Recruitment Office, which is based in HEE, but it does operate on behalf of the four nations. So just bear with me. I'm going to share some slides with you uh, to talk us through. OK, so. Um, Right, so I'm, mine's going to be uh, a very factual account of the process and how it is. So um, I will leave the more uh, narrative based stuff to uh, to the trainees to talk you through about how to make the best of your application. I'll just talk about what the process is. So it's a single process that covers all UK programmes. There's about 1600 each year in total. Um, and it covers IMT, but also covers ACCS internal medicine. Some, um, 
they are they don't make up many posts and most some regions don't have any at all but they are part of the process and you're considered equally um, if you uh, apply for any um, for any posts that are there uh, you only make one application and you're in com uh, in contention for all programs in the country uh, and you'll select your programs at a later stage and we'll touch on that uh, there's only one round we used to have two rounds but we've been filling with the increased competition and therefore we've only needed one round so if you're thinking you might get a second opportunity, uh, I advise you to submit because you uh, because it's unlikely there would be a second round. All programmes are due to start on the 2nd of August unless you can apply for a deferred start date, although they're only uh, available for um, statutory grounds such as maternity or ill health. Uh, in terms of assessment, we have two main elements to that. One is self-assessment, which is used for shortlisting, and the second is an online interview, which makes up 100% of the score used to uh, rank you for offers. There is a website with extensive guidance about the process, imtrecruitment.org. I hope probably most of you have already seen it already. Um, if not, please make sure you refer to it throughout the process. Uh, it does go into quite a lot of detail um, and particularly around things like application scoring, also says how the interview runs. It, it's a pretty transparent process all told. So competition ratios. Um, Jane mentioned earlier that uh, it is more competitive than it used to be. So we can see that in the last few years, it's gone up to around 2.3, 2.4 per post. Uh, now, a lot of applicants will um, apply for multiple specialties, so some of these not everyone will be desperate for IMT, some it will be a backup, uh, but it has got more competitive. Uh, so we get about 90% in the last couple of years have been shortlisted, give or take. Uh, and then last year there were several hundred on the reserve list once all offers have been exhausted. So, uh, and bear in mind, some regions will be more popular than others. It, it's We haven't really got uh, information directly on competition between regions. Uh, there was some data done a couple of years ago, which you can find on the IMT website in the document library to give you an idea, but you, could, you can probably guess from foundation which regions are likely to be more popular than others and therefore harder to get an offer. So here's the timeline. Um, so applications opened last week and they close at 4 p.m. on the 1st of December. The initial finding out whether you get an interview will happen pre-Christmas. Uh, and then the invites will be out over the Christmas period. Um, so yeah, do uh, keep a look out, uh, make sure you're aware of all of these dates and you're expecting that you may receive things. Um, interviews are held from mid-January to mid-February. Uh, there's only one interview that you'll have to go to, uh, but, but it'll be between those dates. And then uh, the back end of the process happens at the end of February and through to early April with interviews, um, rankings released, you'll pro preference your programmes uh, and then offers. So all applications are made on Aureal. Um, so you've probably heard of this already if we're, where foundation applications would have been made. Uh, if you're um, if you're unless you're a current foundation trainee, you'll have to supply evidence of your foundation competence. So if you're a current trainee, you don't have to supply any documents. Chances are, if you're a current foundation trainee, you won't have to supply any documents because the only other documents we require are usually if you've either got some sort of um, disability that you want to claim um, some reasonable adjustments for. Uh, or if you have some fitness to practice issues that you need to declare, things like this, which won't affect most applicants. With self-assessment, um, we, uh, which is as to reiterate what Jane said earlier, please make sure you read the guidance on the website to help you choose the most appropriate option. Um, you must be able to evidence the claims if asked, so you won't be required to upload anything, but you need to know that if you had to, you could upload documents for everything that's being uh, that you've claimed for. There's a very strict rule about no late applications. Um, I'm not really come across any exceptions so far. You'd probably have to be kidnapped or something and not able to access a computer for a month for us to accept a late application. So please, please, please aim to submit early. Um, don't leave it till the last day in case of problems. Uh, and there are no changes after submission. So make sure you've allowed time to check your application. You're 100% happy with it before you submit. So prior to interview, um, we'll be checking eligibility uh, and then so we'll be looking things for foundation competence, 
um, is the main thing. There are a few other things to make sure that we've got everything we need. Most applicants will be fine, uh, but you may find that you're written to and asked to supply something. If that's the case, you'll be given 72 hours to respond. So please keep an eye out on your emails. What's really important is when you apply, you will get an email confirming your application has been submitted. If you haven't received that, then please check your junk email because this will mean that you won't receive any future emails. So it's really important to make sure that you're getting those emails, not so much for what they are at the time, but more because then you'll see uh, messages that often have a short turnaround later on. All, all messages are copied into your uh, Oriel account, so you will be able to uh, pick pick up any there. So if you're not sure, check Oriel, and if you've got a message in your message, but you didn't get it in your email, then that's something to try and sort out with your uh, email provider. So shortlisting will happen by 22nd of December, and essentially all we're doing is we're looking at your score and we're looking at the interview capacity. Uh, as I said, 90% approximately are invited. Um, we do try and get through as many as we can and we basically just go down the scores until we meet capacity. Uh, if any people don't book an interview, we will try and fill uh, who are invited. We'll try and fill their slots with more people. So even in even in January, um, we could be trying to fill slots for those on the reserve list because we want to get every person possible an interview. The invites to interview. So when you get those, you will uh, self book your slot. Uh, but it's first come first served. So what we say is to book the most convenient date for you uh, that is available. Uh, so um, every region is hosting some interviews, but it makes no difference who is hosting your interview as to where you will where you can end up. Uh, you'll be in contention for every single program in the country, regardless of which region hosts your interviews. It's just because there's so many that we need to spread it across all of the regions. So I'm not going to talk about the interview because that's going to come up later uh, in one of the other talks. So I'm not going to go into details about what the interview, how it's made up and anything like that. So I'll we'll just jump forward to the post interview bit. So your interview score will uh, scores will be weighted and we say exactly how we do this on the on the IMT website to form the total score, which will be used for ranking. We don't take your application score into account after um, after shortlisting. You will of course be uh, rated on your, you will be scored on uh, elements of your achievements and your career to date as part of the interview. So that's where that will be reflected. So we'll confirm your appointability and your score and ranking by the 28th of February, which is the same day that programme preferences open. So this is important because programme preferences for IMT is a big deal um, in terms of just administration for you. You can choose from the whole of the UK, which means that there are around 1500 options to choose from. Now, if you won't consider any regions other than uh, one or two, then you don't have to rank all 1500 programmes. You just ignore the ones you don't want. But um, depending on your ranking will depend on how many you feel you need to preference. So knowing your ranking, if you've ranked in the top 100, you know you don't need to preference many posts. Whereas if you rank lower, then you may think you, you need to cast your net wider if you want to take up an IMT programme. So there's a lot of guidance on programme preferences uh, on the website. It's the one thing I'd like to say is that it does take quite a while, um, but you do need to make sure that you only preference things you would accept if offered. Uh, that's really important because sometimes people think, well, I'll just yeah, I don't really want there, but I'll preference it and then maybe I'll get an offer and then maybe I can get a better offer later. It doesn't work like that. You uh, only take something you would accept. Um, and uh, you will find out uh, when you preference, you'll see uh, the IMY one and two rotations for all regions. So um, you can get an idea for how long it could take when you think that each region has so many different options with slightly different rotations of hospital and specialty and you know it depends how much you want to agonize over which one you'd prefer over another but um it, it could take quite a while some regions will give imy3 details but most won't uh, and that's usually sorted out once in the program 
So offers, once we've ranked you and once you've selected your preferences, uh, then we can make offers because that's how the matching algorithm works. It basically works its way down the list. It goes from rank number one, what's your first choice preference? Can I offer it to you? If so, I'll make that offer. If not, what's your second preference, etc. So you will always be made. It doesn't matter about your preferences in terms of the ordering of your preference in terms of offers. When I said no gaming, there's no need to preference a perceived less popular region higher because you think it will increase your chances of an offer. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Just put the preferences in the order you'd like to receive them. And if you're ranked a thousandth, you will uh, be considered for every single program before the person ranked one thousand and first. Once you get an offer, you only have 48 hours to respond. So we do say when we intend to make the first set of offers so you can be ready. Uh, and then each time we make a set of offers, we'll say when we intend to make the next set of offers. So you can always know when this is likely to happen. You have uh, three choices with a sub choice. First is accept you. Um, so basically you are committing to that program. You can hold the offer, which is something you would do if you had, say, applied for more than one specialty and you were waiting for the outcome of that one. You could say, right, well, I'm not wanting to accept it, but I don't want to give it up until I know the outcome. Uh, and there is a holding deadline to when you can do that. You can outright decline. And if you don't make a decision in 48 hours, then that will be treated as a decline. If you accept or hold your offer, you can opt in for upgrading. So what this means is, uh, say you've got your uh, 40th choice preference, you might say, well, I like that, but I prefer my one to 39. You can opt in for upgrading. And when we next run the offers algorithm, if someone releases one of your higher ranked preferences and you are next in line for it, then you would get that offer rather than it going to someone who hasn't yet been made one who's ranked lower than you. So it's a really, meritocratic way of doing it. It tries to get the make the match the highest ranked person with the best possible post they could get. Um, now we have to have these deadlines because we have to get information to employers so they can start doing uh, their rotor planning and get you your rotors um, so uh, and meet code of practice deadlines. So it does have a ceiling on it. And so by um, it's about the 11th of April, I think somewhere around there, uh, you will know exactly which program you're getting and no more upgrades would be possible. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we make offers in iterations. So um, each and each time we say that we've made a set of offers, so you'll know whether an upgrade has been found um, or whether if you're on a reserve list that you remain on the reserve list. It does take a little while to, to shake down, but within I think two to three weeks, offers are pretty much finished. So we'll make about five iterations during that time. And uh, so just some key messages before I hand over. So please refer to the website throughout the process. There is an extensive amount of information on there. Um, uh, and yeah, we've taken a lot of time to learn from what we've heard in the past to try and make it as good as possible. Do meet deadlines. Some of them are really strict and even when they're not strict, it may it may cost you if you miss a deadline. We may be able to reinstate you, for example, if you miss an offer deadline. But if we've already offered your post out to someone else, it's too late. So please do meet deadlines. And as I mentioned earlier, keep an eye on your messages. Some things have a short turnaround. We do try and signal when to expect things. Uh, we know that you're often on nights and or you know, you've got uh, crazy shift hours. So you know, we do try and signpost things, but um, just meet us halfway by checking regularly. And that is me finished. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks very much. Um, I think the best thing to do would be to, if it's OK with everybody, to go on to the, the next few speakers from our trainees um, and then we'll do some questions at the end, because although people might have questions, I think a lot of it might be covered in the in the next in the next few talks, if that's OK. Um, so, um, Hannah, I think you're first. Um, so I'd like to welcome Hannah, although her camera's just gone, so I'm hoping she's still there. Yes. Hello, I'm here, yeah, sorry. Hiya. Hiya, hiya, Hannah. Um, so I'd like to welcome Hannah and Hannah's going to talk. Hannah has just finished IMT, haven't you, Hannah? And she's yes. going to talk to about or talk to us about the her experience of IMT and an IMT overview. So thank you very much for doing this, Hannah. That's cool. 
Um, I'll just start sharing a second. Can everybody see this at the moment? Yeah, looks to be working well. OK, um, so hi, my name is Hannah and I've just completed internal medicine year three at University Hospital North Tees in Stockton on Tees in the Northern Deanery. And I was in the first cohort undertaking the new internal medicine stage one training programme. So today I'll talk about why I chose to apply for IMT, what my worries at the beginning of the programme were, what I found have been the challenges and strengths of IMT, and my reflections on how IMT has helped me to progress as a clinician. It wasn't until the end of foundation that I considered care of the elderly specifically, um, with previous career aspirations, including psychiatry and general practice. Subsequently, I undertook other medical specialty posts as a junior clinical fellow, including in gastroenterology, acute medicine and specialist palliative care, which helped me to decide to apply for internal medicine training. It, care of the elderly or older person, but it had been my most rewarding job, albeit the most stressful. So I needed to see whether I was cut out for medicine and whether medicine really was the right fit for me. Reflecting now, things that I think attracted me to IMT included my previous experiences, my consultants and registrars in older persons medicine and stroke medicine specifically were role models for how I wanted to practice healthcare and what I found interesting. Also, my MDT colleagues, the occupational therapists, nurses, social workers, they were all positive influences for me. The cases I saw were also inspiring and um, I was fascinated by them more than anything else I'd encountered in my career thus far. Just one example included seeing a patient with hyponatremia caused by a spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage due to uncontrolled hypertension. This reflected my interests, which include problem solving and understanding the disease pathologies themselves. I also recognise the variety keeps me stimulated and that tends to come with generalist rather than highly specialised fields. Things that are important for me include providing holistic person-centred care, addressing the biological, psychological and social needs of patients. To do this properly requires working both within multidisciplinary teams, but also between specialties. And I truly love working constructively together to make the diagnosis and provide joined up care. Finally, I think it's important to be honest with yourself about where your areas of strength lie and what you can give to a specialty. I'm someone who's naturally more detailed focused and I also tend to be quite cautious and this means very rapid turnover in settings like A&E suit me less well but also that I'm probably better suited to working as part of a team to share decision making and risk as opposed to solo work such as in general practice. I also love learning and while the opportunity for this is available in every healthcare setting, I think medicine offers more than its fair share. So what were my concerns at the beginning of the programme? Adjusting from foundation training. I think it, transitioning into a new training programme or returning in to training after a period away from it undeniably comes with some degree of apprehension. I'd been very fortunate and had an exceptionally supportive educational supervisor who knew the curriculum and my ARCP requirements at the back of her hand. So I'd been shepherded through. I'd also been based in the same trust for two years, so felt comfortable knowing my colleagues and systems. Suddenly I'd be thrown into new teams with new responsibilities, computer systems, and simultaneously trying to navigate a new portfolio. As someone who finds building trust and constructive workplace relationships some of the more stressful parts of new jobs, I was anxious about building up the courage to ask for enough supervised learning events, which you need as evidence in new portfolio. I'd studied the curriculum quite carefully and looking at the list of conditions and presentations I'd been expected to cover, I was quite overwhelmed. I also knew that sitting exams to obtain membership to the Royal College of Physicians would be a prerequisite of completing training and feared the dreaded PACES exam that everyone talked about so ominously. And finally, what if I got to the end of training and I still wasn't any closer to knowing if older person's medicine was the right choice for me? So this is my personal evaluation of the strengths and challenges of internal medicine training. When I started, IMT was a new training program for trainees and trainers. This has meant a lot of learning on the go about what my roles and responsibilities and learning requirements were. The transition from core medical training, as well as COVID, has meant that some of the changes throughout the past three years, which were meant to have been introduced, I hadn't got all of the benefit out of, um, for example, out of hours intensive care experience. 
taking on the medical trainee role at a junior doctor level is undeniably a massive step up in responsibility from the foundation programme. And when caring for people with increasingly complex needs with chronic NHS staffing shortages, it can be very overwhelming. Frequently during IMT 1 and 2, I was the most senior medic working on the ward supporting junior colleagues. And while there were always seniors who were available to contact for advice and do review several times a week, the input that you have in your in IMT role makes a big difference to the daily running and patient flow. These inpatient responsibilities contribute to the challenges gaining other training experiences, um, namely in outpatient experience and procedural skills. There are additional barriers, including the volume of both IMTs and other training grades, such as higher specialty trainees who also need to gain proficiency in these areas. So I don't think this challenge is limited to internal medicine training stage one. With regards to the strengths, certainly compared to my understanding of how core medical training works, I think there are many strengths to IMT. Mandatory placements, including in intensive care and older persons medicine, um, hone skills like recognising and managing the deteriorating patient, providing generalist palliative care and communicating under a wide range of challenging circumstances. The experience these placements offer is obvious, but even on your routine medical jobs, there are infinite opportunities for bedside learning. I can say I've encountered nearly every listed presentation and condition just on the day job alone. I think IMT3 is one of the biggest triumphs of the programme in preparing us for the medical registrar role. Now you get a whole year dedicated to just learning how to be a general medical registrar, whilst you used to have to start learning how to be a specialty registrar at the same time. And last and not least, there is an active focus on advancing non-clinical skills such as leadership management and quality improvement. And this has been facilitated by formal placements on my weekly skill session in IMT3, as well as through the experience get, um, obtained without even trying as the invaluable internal medicine trainee supporting the ward at large. When I think when I've recently I've been supporting new IMTs, it's made me realise how much the programme has supported my personal and professional development. I've had so much experiential learning, teaching from excellent role models, encountered a wide range of pathologies and worked with many different specialties. It's been very rewarding. The objective feedback I've received has also reassured me that the doctor I am now is leaps and bounds from the ones I was three years ago, and I feel ready to take the plunge into the next challenge. Our population has increasing numbers and complexity of health and social care needs, which are hard to balance. And these require a generalist as opposed to single disease oriented approach. And I feel that not only has this training program given me the tools to do this, but made me value and enjoy general medicine far more. There are times when you might be the expert in generalism on specialty wards with the most relevant experience, for example, in approach to end of life care. Not all of our medical seniors have benefited from the same formal training as we have. Equally, even this early in my career, I've seen the evolution of medicine, which has challenged my belief that holistic care was the preserve of older persons medicine. I'm going on to a trust grade registrar post in stroke medicine. And while I'm not any more certain about my ultimate future career path, I now believe it isn't possible to have too much experience in too many specialties to develop your competence, confidence and compassion as a physician. The equivalent of six months of acute medicine, as well as the shared entrustment decision with my educational supervisor about when I was ready to act as solo medical registrar on site, as opposed to being thrust in at the unilateral decision, have been invaluable for my clinical development and have made the past 15 months feel like a supported step up and a training experience as opposed to purely service provision. I started IMT3 truly uncertain if I was ever going to manage the medical registrar role and now with the training that I've received that was tailored to my individual needs and the support of second to none supervision, I've achieved this goal. Finally, I've increasingly recognised others who value and revel in positions of leadership as role models for me, and I think IMT has provided me with ample opportunity to develop my own skills. On the wards, your input can be paramount to effective patient flow, setting examples of clinical practice, co fostering collaborative working relationships amongst multidisciplinary teams to yield better patient care, and being an invaluable contact for clinical seniors and juniors alike. 
Curriculum specified requirements off the wards, including quality improvement projects and human factors training, have also strengthened my leadership skills. And finally, I felt that to make the changes this programme is intended to achieve requires the input of trainees like ourselves. So amongst several things, I've been a hospital representative during IMT and being able to shape training on the local level, working with my local postgraduate education teams has yielded better opportunities for me and my colleagues. Thank you very much for listening. And if anyone's got any questions, thank you, Hannah. Ask. Th thank you so much for that. Um, and I think what we'll do actually is, is move on to the next talk, if that's OK with people, and then we'll do questions at the end. Um, so yeah, every, every, all the speakers are staying, aren't you? So um, we'll take all the questions at the end, if that's OK. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so we're going to move to Paula next. Um, so Paula has recently finished her IM year two year. Um, and she's going to chat to us about the application process, aren't you, Paula? Thank you very much, Paula. Hello, can everyone see the slides? If you can't, then. Can't see the slides as yet. It looks like a blank screen. Oh, it looks like. Sharing is paused. Oh, hold on. I think I need. Oh, there you go. There we go. Sorted. That's it. Fab. Okay. So hello, um, for those that don't know me, my name's Paula. I have just finished IMT2 up here in the northeast. So I worked at Newcastle Hospitals and then worked at Sunderland. Um, what this presentation is going to be is just a brief perspective of, of mine on the portfolio, how you can get the maximum points with the least time, because some of the things that you are on the portfolio are quite time consuming. So I'm just going to take you through that quickly and sort of highlight areas where you can maybe get some points that are going to be worthwhile for you getting an interview. So just a little bit about me, just so that you know what who I am. Um, I went to Edinburgh Uni and then came down to foundation training at the QE in Gateshead, which is in the northeast. Um, I then did a teaching fellow in acute medicine because I was like Hannah and didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and then decided to apply for IMT. Um, found it a really great varied programme. I got to work in lots of different specialties, um, including haematology, which is something that I'd always been interested in. And I did that job as an IMT one. Um, and actually, I thought at the end of IMT2 that maybe it was what I wanted to pursue as my career, but wasn't totally sure. So after speaking to Dr Jones, who was my educational supervisor, um, I've gone out of programme, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end. Um, so basically, if you get to the end of IMT2 and you're not sure what you want to do and you're not sure if you want to do IMT3, but there's something that you're interested in, you can take a year out to do a specialty that you might be interested in like me doing haematology for a year and then if things don't work out and you decide that you want to come back into IMT3 your number's still there waiting for you so that's what I'm doing at the moment I'm still at work now as you can see um, this is a very busy slide but it's just a kind of overview of the application scoring I'll not go into it in too much detail because I'm going to cover them all individually but overall you can achieve 40 points you've got a maximum number of points for each of these areas some of them are more achievable than others so these are the ones that I think are time consuming. If you've got them, great. You might already have them. If you don't, I wouldn't waste your time, especially if you're at the end of F2 and thinking about applying quite soon. Some of these things can take quite a long time. So there might be more efficient ways for you to get points. Postgraduate degrees. Um, if you've got one, great. People who are postgrad who did medicine afterwards, fab, well done. You guys will get loads of points for this. Um, if you do a postgraduate certificate that is not a PG cert in teaching and you complete that, then you could get a point for a postgraduate diploma or postgraduate certificate, but it must be complete. So if you're doing a teaching fellow year like I did after F2, if it's in progress, it doesn't point, it doesn't have points. So it says there are not no um, it's not permissible to claim points for partially completed qualifications. You can put it on there as evidence of something that you're doing, which is good, and then you can discuss it in the interview, but it will not get you points. So just something to be aware of if you are thinking of doing a PG cert, it needs to be complete to count. Prizes and stuff, um, all of these are from uni. So if you got one again, great. Um, if you didn't get one, don't worry about it. Oh, in the grand scheme of things, it's not worth a huge amount of marks. Um, you can make those marks up elsewhere. So if you've got them, great. Just make sure as... Um, Jane was saying that you can evidence them. You need to have um, certificates and it gives you the percentages of the um, number of people in your class that need to have um, obtained that distinction or qualification or whatever. So say if it was 30% of your year got distinction, um, it wouldn't count. So you just have to be careful when you read through your certificates and check and make sure that they actually fit these criteria specifically. 
publications quite a lot of time. I'm still sitting nicely on zero points after having something rejected yesterday. So it's a lot of time and a lot of work publications. If you've got them again, brilliant, well done. And if it's something that you're interested in, it's great to discuss in your interview. But the if you are looking at eight points and saying, oh, I'm going to get eight points and it's going to get me into IMT, it could take you ages. So I think there's more points available that take less time. The rest of the stuff, you should be able to get at least one point for everything, if not way more than that. Presentations, definitely doable. So um, regional meetings should happen. If there's something that you're particularly interested in, so say I was interested in haematology, when I was an IMT one, I did an audit, which got me points for audit. And then I presented it at a regional meeting, which was run by the haematology department. And that got me points for audit and it got me points for a regional meeting. So what I would say is just put feelers out in your department and try and do it in something that you're interested in if you know what you're interested in. If you do a project or if you just get an interesting case report, try and find out what sort of regional meetings are available in your region. It's very easy to present at those and it's it's five points. It's, it's really good, way more than high distinction for your medical degree. So these are good points to get. Make sure you choose your maximum points option. Like um, Jane said, it's, you want to make sure that you're scoring yourself well so that you get an interview. But again, make sure that you have evidence for it. If you do present at a regional meeting, what I would probably use as evidence and what I did when I was an IMT was used a PowerPoint presentation, but I also had a letter from the consultant who ran the regional meeting to confirm my attendance because you could have just made a PowerPoint presentation and you might not have been able to present it. So they'll often ask for written confirmed evidence from a consultant. So just it's easy to get these things, but you have to be prepared and ready to show it when you need to. Training and teaching. Um, so a PG cert in teaching. Um, if you do a teaching fellow job, you're probably likely to get one of those, which is great. And it gives you two points for training and teaching, but it has to be complete. So actually, if you're in the process of doing it, it doesn't count. What does count is the e-learning for health modules. So they've got some of those modules on training and teaching. So actually that can get you one point. So just do those modules, get them signed off, evidence that you've done them. And then if they ask for evidence of training and teaching, you can just upload those and that's, that'll give you an extra point. So everybody should be able to do that. Teaching experience. Um, if, you're, if, you're in an F, if you're an F1 or if you're an F2 planning to take a year out, it would be easy to actually organise a local teaching programme and teach over a period of three months. That's something that you could set up within your department, whether it's teaching medical students, whether it's teaching the nurses. So where I'm working at the moment, me and my colleague have set up a teaching programme for the nurses on the ward. We don't teach every session. We've just scheduled them and said what they are. And then we are organising it. So we get the points for organisation, which is an extra three points. And then you actually have to teach less. So you're probably doing less work. You're just doing the organising. Um, so it's worth doing, especially if you're planning on taking some time out thinking about setting that up in your area if you can, but it has to be over three months and you have to have evidence of formal feedback. So whether that's um, feedback from the consultant who is working with you to organise the teaching programme, you should have formal feedback um, forms that you take to your teaching sessions. And I would recommend like killing the trees and just taking them as paper forms because actually trying to get people to fill out online feedback forms is an absolute nightmare so even if you can just get eight or nine people to fill out a feedback form for you you can collate all that evidence and get it signed off by whoever watched you teach or whoever was attending the teaching session and that should count so you need to have evidence of formal feedback which is a really important part for all of these things even for the one point where you taught medical students occasionally you need to have evidence of formal feedback. That could be a developing the clinical teacher form that's in your portfolio, but it's just really important to make sure that you get these things observed and you get formal feedback um, just in case they ask for it. And it also makes it easier for you to then read through when you're planning to apply and you can think back on the teaching sessions that you delivered and maybe use those as examples in your interview. Quip, get them five points. You can do something quick. It doesn't need to be a really in-depth um, quality improvement project that's going to take months or years. Most NICE guidelines have got an audit template, but I would just recommend speaking to someone in the department that you're working in, especially if it's something that you're interested in, because then you'll be able to talk about it in your interview and say, is there an audit that's actually already been started by someone else that needs completing? Or is there an audit, something that you think needs to be audited? Or even better, if there's something that doesn't work well in your area, think about doing an audit on that. What you need to have is two cycles of a quality improvement project. So you need to have 
done something, check to see whether or not the thing that you've done has made a difference and then checked again to see whether it's made a difference. So you need to have two cycles, which is the important part of um, getting the five points. Um, this is slightly different than the reg applications. For the reg applications, you get more points if you supervise someone. So actually, if you're in a more senior role, if you're an F3, you can maybe work with an F1, supervise them, help them do a project. You can both get points, um, but you could get extra points for supervision. So some just something to think about at this point. Um, as they say, presentation is not an essential stage, so you don't necessarily need to have presented it. If you've audited it and you've done your research and you've got your data, you could make a presentation, but you don't necessarily need to have presented it. Leadership, um, more stuff counts than you think. Local leadership role for six or more months, that could be being in the mess president, being a trainee representative within a hospital committee. I'm sure everyone's had emails for those. It's worth two points, so it's actually worth doing. I know it sometimes can take up a bit of time, but actually you can make a bit of a difference within your area and also get two points for applying for IMT. It, it doesn't just count for medical stuff. So if you did guides, if you did stuff when you were at uni in terms of like student societies and you were, say, head of something, then that would count as long as you've got evidence. So say you just get someone to write a letter for you, just confirming that, make sure that you've got your evidence, that would count for two points. So just have a think back of for anything that you've done, because I'm sure you've all done loads, and just see what you might be able to get to get those two points. So that's that's the application process, that's the form, that's everything that you need to do. It probably seems like a lot, but actually if you take it over time, it's it's okay and you will probably have more points than you think. I've obviously finished IMT, so I'm an IMT, well, I'm, not, I'm an IMT nothing now, I'm a, a haematology clinical fellow. So as I said, I wasn't sure what to do after IMT too, because I didn't feel ready to apply directly to a specialty, particularly one that is very niche and is quite different from medicine. Um, so I wanted to take a bit of time to think and decide what I wanted to do. Um, so I've gone out of programme pause, OOP, which basically just means I've kind of put a stop on my IMT. I've gone out of programme and I've applied for a job in a different trust which does specialist haematology. So I'm working here for a year doing a sort of interim reg post where I'm getting to look at blood films and do bone marrows and things that I'm interested in, which has been great. But I have the option to go back to IMT3 if I decide to at the end of this. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet, but I just to know that it's way more flexible than you think. As Hannah said, it's not a cookie cutter programme that can be adapted to you. Um, group two specialties um, for ST3, some of you might not know because I know I didn't, um, a few things don't need IMT3, so haematology doesn't need IMT3, medical and clinical oncology don't need IMT3, I think medical microbiology doesn't need IMT3 and neither does immunology, um, so all of those things you can apply for directly after IMT3, IMT2. Sorry, um, You can have a break after it, if there's no um, problem with getting penalised for years out like we do in surgery where the points get divided if you want to take time out as Hannah says and get more experience there's never too much experience in medicine because of its breadth so you do not get penalised for taking years out so if you said at the end of IMT I want to just have some time to myself that's okay you're allowed to do that um, what I would say have, as I'm in the process of applying for ST3 now is that the application scoring is very very similar to IMT so if you can get a good portfolio now, it'll stand you in good stead and you'll have less stress when you're applying for SC3. The only real change is that you get points for MRCP and you get some of the specialties have additional points for commitment to specialty. And as I've said, there's a slight change to quality improvement scoring, but very little. So overall, the score matrix is identical. So if in your early years, you can get a good, strong portfolio with lots of points, you then don't have to worry about it so much when you're just trying to get through IMT. So I think my top tips would be just start preparing early. I had no idea what the application process looked like when I was an F2 even and then looked at it and was like, oh God, I could have done all these things, but I haven't. It's so easy to get these points um, if you know about them. So just have a think about what you can do in your area. The scoring criteria that I've put in this um, presentation is on the link that I've attached here. Um, evidence could be checked. So just make sure that you can back up your points. Don't be too shy about scoring yourself well but equally don't lie because if you then overscore yourself and are untruthful on multiple things and you don't have evidence it could lead to problems. Your application score only gets you the interview um, and then your points actually no longer count which is a new thing that's different from when I applied to IMT3. IMT, sorry. So Lydia is going to tell you a little bit more about the interview um, 
what the interview does have is an aspect where you talk about yourself and what you've done. So actually, if you've got a nice, good, strong portfolio, it's sometimes just good for you to look at and say, right, actually, I've done all this stuff. I can talk about all these things in my interview. So I think getting your portfolio as good as you can is the best way to um, do as well as you can and try to get the best job you can for IMT. OK, that's it. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, thank you. And for the personal discussion about the flexibility as well at the end. So thank you very much, Paula. Um, so we're going to move on to our final speaker, our final trainee. So Lydia, who's one of our IMU ones who started in August. Um, so Lydia has been through the virtual interview process. So she's going to talk a bit about that. So thank you, Lydia. Lovely. Thanks, Anita. Let me just share my screen. Can you see that? Yep. Perfect. Um, so yeah, so my name's Lydia. I'm an IMT1 in the Northern Deanery as well. And I'm going to be talking about the virtual interview experience. So first things first, we'll just talk about the interview structure. So this interview structure for this year of applications is new. So it's slightly different to the interview that I sat last year. So the new difference comes in the first section. So the first section is application and suitability. So why do you think you're suitable to be an IMT? And it starts with a two minute presentation. So this is new for this year. So it's two minutes for you to talk to the interviewers and basically just sell yourself. So explain why you think you're appropriate for this job role. You can't use a PowerPoint for this presentation. You can use notes. Um, but you just need to be talking through sort of your key strengths and your key achievements. And I'll go through that in more detail in a little bit. After that, you would then have four minutes of questions from your interviewers where they might be asking you things about your career to date, thinking about your future plans and your aspirations and your career, um, your achievements and delving sort of into more depth with these, any positive feedback you received in the past as well. And I'm going to mention it again later on, but reading the person spec for IMT and the IMT training goals is going to be really important for you to ace this section. You then would move on to the clinical scenario and the handover. So you have three minutes of reading preparation time. So you get presented with a case. You've got three minutes to prepare. You can write notes during that. You then have eight minutes to talk through the scenario. So it's not a role play. It's more of a, a conversation and a discussion about the case with your interviewers where you would explain what questions you would ask, what your investigations would be, what your differentials would be and how you would manage this patient. And at the end of that scenario, you have one minute to do a handover and that would be a handover to a, a more senior doctor who would in most cases probably be the med reg. And then at the end of the interview, you have your ethics, professionalism and governance question, which is just five minutes. Again, just talking through um, a case. So it's a moral, ethical or legal case discussion. Again, not a dreaded role play, um, just talking through the case and then being asked questions by your interviewers. So I'll go through each of these different sections in a little bit and how I prepared. Um, but first of all, just thinking about the logistics of an online interview. So as previously mentioned, obviously it's online, um, but you can be interviewed um, by interviewers from any deanery. Um, it doesn't make a difference where you're interviewed. I personally just chose to be interviewed in the Northern Deanery because it's where I graduated, where I wanted to work, and I just felt a little bit less scary being interviewed there. So if you do strongly want to be interviewed somewhere particular, just make sure you're on it with booking your interview. Um, thinking about when, so interviews open sort of, they start in mid-January and they go through to mid-February. So if you know you've got plans coming up in those months or you've got some horrific on-calls, again, it might just be worth being a little bit more on it when booking your interview so you know it's going to be at a time that suits you best. Um, and then your interview will be conducted by two interviewers, so two clinicians, and you'll also have in the interview at least one member of the admin team. They sort of won't have any effect on your interview. They're just there to sort of formalise the process. But the only time you might be aware of them is that they'll be in charge of timekeeping. So if your two minute presentation is overrunning or you're overrunning in your clinical scenario, they'll put up the virtual hand and that will be a sign to the interviewers that they need to cut you off. So timings will be really strict during the interview. Um, if you're not already used to using Microsoft Teams, if you prefer Zoom, it's probably worth just getting yourself used to using Teams. It does work a little bit differently. Make sure you feel happy because there's probably 
nothing worse than already being stressed about the interview and then being stressed because your Wi-Fi isn't working or you can't unmute yourself. So just probably have a sort of a practice interview with a friend or a family member that isn't in the same house just to check that they can hear you, that you 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 look clear in the picture and just make sure you've got like a plain background behind you. Um, I know some people had to do their interviews at work. So if you're going to have to do that, make sure that you found a room within the hospital that's quiet, that no one's going to disturb you. So thinking about the first question, so this is application and suitability. And the guidance given for this question is give an overview of your achievements to date, which are most relevant to your application to be a trainee in internal medicine. So as I said before, it's two minutes, so not very long at all. And you're trying to sell yourself as the best candidate you can possibly be for IMT. Because it's not going to be very long to talk about all of your achievements, I think you need to come up with a really clear structure. And if I was having to do it this year, I would probably use the IMT person spec to guide me through this. Um, I've put the link to it down here, but if you just Google INT person spec, it's not hard to find. And I've just sort of screen grabbed a section that I think would probably be most relevant to this section. So this is the academic skills that they're looking for. So you've got the essential criteria, which includes things like research and being engaged in quality improvement. And then you've got desirable criteria as well. So degrees, prizes, awards, distinctions, publications. So it's all things that Paul has already talked about as well. So hopefully you'll already sort of know where you're scoring once you've filled in your oral application. And then you've also got things like um, interest and commitment to specialties. So have you been on any courses, um, anything like that that just shows that you have shown dedication to IMT. And then finally, evidence of teaching. So those are sort of the, the key things that I would consider. And before I started preparing for this, I probably would just have a reread of that oral application, see what you've already jotted down and what you felt meant that was going to make you a good candidate and make you unique. Um, especially if you're doing your interview at 5 p.m. on a Friday, you want to just be making your um, your presentation just a little bit different and showing that you're not like everyone else that's applying, hopefully. So I would start by thinking about your greatest achievements and why, and then I'd try and link them to these headings. So I probably would start with a very brief introduction about who you are, what your career so far has been, maybe where you've worked and where you graduated. And then if you've graduated with honours or distinction, you could mention it at that point. And then if you've got lots to cover, I think you probably just need to start just going through it. So what audits and research projects have you been involved in? Have you presented any of those nationally or internationally? What evidence of teaching have you got? So is it teaching peers, teaching medical students? Have you got any leadership roles that you've held? So remember that could be at university, so as part of a society, or have you been a member of the mess committee? Um, if you've taken years out of training, so I think all of us that have spoken today have taken years out of training, definitely talk about them. They are what makes you unique and hopefully interesting and talk about what you've achieved during those. Have you won any prizes? If you haven't won prizes, have you ever had an excellence report at work or a great ex or whatever your trust calls them? Mention those because, again, they show that, you know, you're a good doctor and you've had positive feedback about, about your medical career so far. And then if you've got time at the end, you mention your achievements outside of medicine. They're probably not going to be as relevant, but if you can link them to why they're going to make you a good IMT trainee, definitely mention them. So... If me talking about all of this stuff has made you feel really stressed, um, just remember that with this interview, they're expecting you to be at the level of a good F2. So we're not expecting you to be able to hit all of these different um, subtitles. All of you should have done a quip for your portfolio. So hopefully you all should have a quip that you could talk about as an achievement. Everyone should have filled in their developing the clinical teacher as well. So everyone should be able to talk about teaching. And as I said before, your achievements at medical school count. So talk about them as well if you need to. And then after that, so after your two minutes of presentation, you probably get a little bit of a breather and you're going to get four minutes of questions. I think the elephant in the room is why are you applying to IMT? So I definitely would sit down and prepare for that question. I think if they don't ask that, that would be a bit weird. Um, have a think about why you want to apply for IMT. So is it that you really enjoyed an F2 job? Was it that you did a taster and you really enjoyed that? Have you done a quip within a medical specialty that you found really interesting? Have you been to a conference? 
or is it just that you've spoken to your registrars and your consultants within a particular specialty and you think this is the career for you? I would be prepared to explore an achievement that you've mentioned in more detail. So it might be an achievement that you've briefly touched upon on, on your oral application, or it might be something that you quickly mentioned in your presentation. If you've mentioned it, just read through it the night before. For example, if it's a research project you've done, kind of know it inside out, just in case they ask you to talk through it in more detail. Have a little think about future plans and career plans. Um, you might not know what specialty you want to do, but maybe at least be able to narrow it down into group one and group two specialties that we spoke about a little bit earlier just to show that you've done some thinking about it and you've you've given it some consideration. I definitely would have a look at the IMT programme and the curriculum. Again, I've linked it here. Um, if you just type into Google IMT curriculum, it'll come up. You, I think it's like a 60 page document. We're not expecting you to read all of it, um, but you should be aware of what the learning outcomes for IMT are. Um, they're kind of broken down into things called capabilities and practice. So I would have a look at what they are, broadly speaking, and understand um, how IMT works. So the fact that we're expecting IMTs to work in outpatient situations, inpatients, um, seeing the acute unselected take, and then more specialist patients as well. So that broad understanding, I think, is quite important. And then try and think of examples for leadership, teamwork, prioritising time, an ethical dilemma you've been involved in at work, just in case they ask you um, and you can then come to it really quickly. And then again, think about dedication to specialty as well. And then finally, you move on to the clinical scenario, which is probably the part of the interview that you probably would dread the most. Um, there's no easy way to prepare for this apart from just to keep practising. So practice with your colleagues at work. Um, if you've got a nice reg at work that is happy to go through some cases with you, that would be really helpful or your friends as well. And just practice giving sort of clear investigations, differentials, management. So as I said before, you get some time to prepare. So you get three minutes of reading. So they'll give you a very brief vignette to read. So it's probably only going to be one or two sentences. And from that, you then get three minutes. I took some plain paper room with me and I wrote down sort of based on that presenting complaint what my investigations would be and what my differentials would be um, just in case my mind went blank and I had something to fall back on. You then talk through the case with the interviewers and they sort of guide you through the case. As I said before it's not a role play and then at the uh, halfway through they'll ask you to probably interpret some sort of investigation so it might be bloods, a chest x-ray, an LP result Something, some sort of interpretation. So this is another reason not to do the interview on your phone because it's going to be quite hard to interpret a chest x-ray if you're doing it on your phone to so make sure you've got a fairly large screen. And at the end, you have one minute to hand over to a senior, so probably the med reg. If you look here, this shows you how they score the clinical scenario. So your second mark just comes from the handover. So just one minute of handover. So don't think that you know how to do an S-bar handover and not prepare for it just make sure it's nice and slick and that you're you're covering all the key points and then your final question is the ethical professionalism and governance question so again the main way to prepare for this is just to practice scenarios so I just went to the library at work and got out these two books on medical ethics um, I'm sure any book would be fine um, or just have a little look on the internet I think key topics to just prepare for and be aware of would be consent, um, best interest decisions, so when you make them, confidentiality, um, mental health, so make sure you're aware of what the different sort of mental health acts are, and then have a little think about resource allocation as well. And I just check that you understand the legality of issues relating to these key topics. And I think if you've done that, you probably would be able to apply those topics and sort of your ethical principles to pretty much any scenario and be able to talk through it. Um, you don't get any preparation time for this question, so they just ask you the question, you just have to go straight into it. So you need to be fairly prepared beforehand. So my top tips for the interview would be um, sort of the logistics of it, check your internet connection and microphone before the day. Um, if you're as paranoid as me, I had, um, I borrowed my housemate's laptop as well, just in case something went wrong with mine. Um, have a practice interview on team so you just know how it works. Reread your oral application prior to interview. 
just so it's fresh in your head about what your key strengths are and then don't be afraid to mention the points on your oral application again as um Paula said you're sort of starting afresh with your points so just keep hammering the same points because you're getting points again for it every time you mention it and then as I mentioned the IMT recruitment page is really helpful for talking through the interview structure and have a look at the IMT person spec and I think if you do all of that you'll be absolutely fine with the interview. Thank you very much, Lydia. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers, especially the trainees, for their excellent presentations. Um, we've now got a bit of time for questions. Um, I know there's quite a few people here, so um, I think if you pop your hands up, um, that would be great, and we'll work our way through any questions. Um, if, you, if you are not able to put your hand up and you want to just um, uh, ask or put something in the chat if the chat's working then um, please feel free to do that as well um, so any questions I think we've worked our way through all the ones in the chat but if have you um, been answering if, them in the chat <laughs> yes if, if we overlooked uh, anything then um, do raise your hand or pop it in the chat again I just uh, while people deciding whether they have any questions, just to follow up on something Lydia just said at the um, end there is um, uh, if there is any major technical problem on the day, we will do our best to accommodate you. Um, so it's not necessarily a one shot deal, but we just can't guarantee it will depend um, on when it happens and what other interviews there are remaining. Because we're trying to fill every gap possible. So we're trying to minimise gaps, but we'd certainly do our best to reschedule you if there were technical issues. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in now. I think um, one is what type of evidence is needed for leadership roles? Um, Paula, I think you covered that in one of your slides, didn't you? Do you want to just go through that again? Would that be all right? Yeah, so um, I got points because I helped my friend. I worked for a charity with him. So basically what I did was I got him to write a letter on headed paper that just said that I had worked with him for the charity for um, doing this role and kind of what sort of things I did. So I think just as long as you can evidence things with, there's Laura, the haematology reg, taking the blood <laughs> film. Um, as long as you can evidence the, yeah, I would say get something on a bit of headed paper signed by someone more senior than you. So whether or not if you were part of a society at uni, whether it's signed by the president or whether it's signed by someone who was the president before you that then took on that role anything like that for sort of um roles within your um workplace you could just get one of the consultants who organizes it to sign it so say if you're a junior doctor rep get a consultant to write you something on headed paper just anything with headed paper and a signature that looks official thank you paula um and there's some more questions coming in stephen i think you've been answering them as we as we've been chatting as well so the there's a, a question about what sort of evidence and things, and I think you've you've answered that pretty much in the chat by the looks of it. Uh, yeah, I was just replying to someone who's asked, will you ever ask regarding why you want to work in a particular region? Um, I would be disappointed if a question came up in the interview, but you were asked about which region because that shouldn't come into it. So um, yeah, that should play no part in the interview asking about where you want to work just why IMT. And there's a question here, Stephen, about deferred entry. Um, I think you mentioned it was statutory reasons, didn't you? Would, could you explain a bit more about that for us, please? Yeah, so if, if you um, are on maternity leave um, or if you have had some sort of illness or accident that's going to delay your return to work, you can apply for a deferred start date, which you would do after you accept an offer. Um, you can, this could include if you've been on maternity leave during foundation and that will delay completion of foundation. So you might not actually be on maternity leave in August next year, but your completion of foundation will be late because of that. Then you can also apply for a deferred start date on that basis. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and then there's a couple of questions again about about points. Um, I should say, if you, I'm, I'm sure people will have lots of questions about points once once they start going through that and preparing their application. There, there is lots and lots of information on the website about about um, how to claim points and what sort of things count for how many points in each area. And um, so I'd encourage people to refer back to that. 
Um, but Paula, there's a couple of questions. One about um, courses around teaching evidence. Would you, yeah. would you be okay to answer that for us? Yeah, I can see there's a couple. Of, so someone's asked, is distinction related to the medicine degree only for the whole MBH, MBCHB? Yes, for the top scoring one. No, for the merits or other points. So you couldn't get the three points because that's for distinction or honours related to your medical degree. But you could get another scoring point if you got distinction in, say, year four, year three. Um, are Google Forms for feedback for teaching acceptable? I would say yes, I think, as long as it's feedback. For, yeah, I would say yes. Yeah. Um, I've, I've used those before. For presentations, can you use the meeting agenda as evidence for a presentation? Yes, I did that. Um, I had an international presentation that I didn't go to, but my poster went, so I still got, um, I think as long as you can, it went to an international conference, you can still get the points. So I included the agenda, which had my name on it and the poster. So yes, that's how I evidenced that and included the poster as well. Um, so what about teaching the, evidence the as teaching, well? The teaching evidence, um, I don't think you would get any more points for doing a teaching course that you paid for compared to ELFH because you only, it's one point for teaching courses, at one point for anything less than a PG cert and then it's two points for a PG cert. So one point is one point. Um, if you can get it for free, it's probably just as well doing the ELFH courses unless you're really interested in doing training for teaching, but I wouldn't, um, I don't think it'll get you more points. Thank you, Paula. Um, the next couple of questions are more about the um, the process. So if I can come back to you, Stephen, if that's all right. So um, somebody's asking about when to apply, if they're doing an F, how does it work if you do an F3 and do you apply during your F3 to IMT? So you'd apply this, you'd apply this time of year to start the following August is how it works, isn't it, Stephen? Yeah, that's right. The only thing is you'll need to uh, you'll need to attach your completion of foundation competence certificate uh, with your application, um, so we know that you've already you've already achieved your uh, foundation competence. Thank you. And the next question is about um, somebody not understanding how to provide evidence. Um, um, so that at the moment they don't upload the information to the website. That's right, isn't it? But could be asked for it at a later date. Yeah, that's correct. Um, there, it's potential. We, we we can't say whether or not it will happen, but there is potential. If you were asked to provide it as part of an audit, then uh, you would need to be able to provide it. So Thanks. that's yeah, that, that's basically it. Thank you. Um, and the next question is about: Does the interview panel like that you have a preference for a specific specialty, or does it look bad as IMT is meant to be a more general approach? I don't think it matters. It's just showing that, that you're um, interested in in a medical career. Um, so if you're interested in a specialty specifically, then mention that. That's that's fine from our point of view. Um, and where are we at now? The questions are coming thick and fast still. Um, do um, virtual conferences count this, the same as international things? Um, I don't know if, um, Stephen, do you want to take that one? Uh, I think it would, it sounds reasonable to me that if it was open to international, particularly because there is a there is a caveat about things that were cancelled due to COVID. So it seems if something was moved online because of COVID, then that seems reasonable. Thank you. Um, and then there's one more question about the interview points and the overall ranking and things. I think you included that in your talk, Stephen. Would you like to just run through that again? Yeah, no, they're only used for shortlisting. So you need to get enough points for shortlisting and then it's all down to the interview. Now, part of the interview will be a reflection of your kind of achievements to date. Um, so, you know, that, that will carry some weight there, but it's not like, oh, I got 20 points. That will count towards my final score it doesn't work like that but obviously the more points you get the uh, the more likely the uh, interviewers are going to be impressed when it comes to that question thank you Stephen um I, th I think as as Paula mentioned as well if you've got lots of things um on your application don't forget to mention them all at, at interview because you get points for them at interview as well so um, I think both you Paula and Lydia mentioned that didn't you that's important to, to mention things uh, mention things again um I think that's all of the questions. Um, we'll give people another minute or two just in case any more have come up or if we've missed any. But I think I think we've got most of the questions there. Um, 
I, I just want again to to thank all the speakers, um, especially the, the trainees for doing this for us today. Um, and to say to everybody who's joined us that good luck with your applications. Um, we hope that we've encouraged you to apply to IMT um, and we've given you lots of advice today. This will be recorded on the, has been recorded and will be on the JRCPTB website for you to look back at a later date as well. Um, and there is already lots of information on the JRCPTB recruitment website. So um, have a look at that. We've provided lots of links here. But if you just Google these things, um, then all the information is available. Um, I think somebody just popped their hand up, actually. Anita, there, there are three more questions and one of a person who uh, popped a hand up was one of those. So should we should we do that and then call yes, time? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, the first one's probably is not for me, really, is which eLife modules do we do for teaching points? Is this info available on the website? Um, oh, Paula, ELFE, sorry, ELFE, I misread that. Yeah, I think, Paula, you suggested you suggested one, or is it just something that there's a few on the eLearning for Healthcare um, website that somebody could do for teaching? Is that right? Yeah, I can't remember what the name of it is because I didn't actually do it. It was actually my partner did it for surgical training. Um, but I am looking on the website now, trying to find out. They they have something called teaching methods. I'd probably just go on and have a look and then I can maybe get it sent out via email if there were any specific ones that he did. I know they've got they certainly got some ones on kind of general teaching methods, which would probably be sufficient, but they've definitely got some on there. Not sure what they are specifically, though. Great. Thank you, Paula. Um, and then there's a question about how many points are usually needed on average to be shortlisted. I don't know if you want to take this one, Stephen. Yeah, it's a bit tricky because uh, we don't know how many applications we're going to receive. Um, what I think what I can say is a, two years ago, it was about 11, something like that. Last year, it was about 13, although it did go down a little bit once we started working our way through the reserve list. So it probably ended up around 11. Um, something to note is we have reduced the overall number of points available this year, though, so um, probably the score will go down, um, assuming the application numbers are similar. So if you've got 11, if you've got 13 plus, I'd be very surprised if you weren't shortlisted, but can't guarantee it because we don't know how many will apply. Um, below that, I would think 10 plus you're probably going to be OK, but it's really hard to say. It's really hard. Great. Thank you, Stephen. I think the next question is probably for you as well. It's about is there anywhere for extra information on the application or is it just the, the boxes that so are there? It, it's the boxes to justify the self-assessment scores. There are a couple of questions about commitment to uh, IMT, why you've applied and uh, what skills you have. So those are opportunities. Uh, you can also mark down training courses um, as a way of indicating Thing that you have done things which um, show that you have an interest in that area. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and a question for Lydia. I think, Lydia, if that's OK, um, mm -hmm. how is it best to prepare for the clinical scenarios? Um, I guess the clinical scenarios are all things that you would be expected to be able to manage at a level of an F2. So I guess anything that you're managing on your own calls is probably going to be helpful for practising sort of what these scenarios might be. Um, if you really want a book, I guess, like, like the Oxford Handbook for Keep Medicine, if you wanted to flick through something just to reassure yourself. But I think it is one of those things where just practice random scenarios with your colleagues, because probably anything could come up. Anything that's sort of a fairly acute situation could be fair game. Thank you, Lydia. Um, and then I think I think that's all the written questions. Somebody put their hand up before and then took it down. His um. Um, are there any more questions? I can't see any hand up, hands up just at the minute. So um, great. OK, we'll call it a day then if that's OK with everybody. Um, just left to me really to thank all of our speakers again. Thank you all for joining us. Please refer to all the information as well on, on the website um, and this talk that's been recorded. Um, and good luck with all of your applications. Um, OK, thank you very much.